Today I'd like to continue our journey through the awesome book of Numbers in the Bible. We've been taking a look at uh, the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, the book of Leviticus. We've completed a series on them. And uh, in our previous video, video, we started the book of Numbers, and we are up now to chapter 5. Uh, and in chapter 5, the Lord tells Moses uh, to expel anyone who was unclean from the camp. Uh, interesting. Uh, expel anyone who was unclean. This applied to both males and females. Very unusual, this even-handed. Usually it's, uh, you know, we see a lot of mention of the male or the female, but male and female together, very unusual. So this is kind of a standout verse here in uh, Numbers, the beginning of chapter 5 in Numbers. Uh, and why would you expel someone who is unclean? The concept behind this is the idea of the importance of ritual purity. Very, very important in the Jewish concept here. And so if somebody was unclean, they must get out of the camp. Or they must not you know, spread it to anyone else. Somewhat similar to our experience today with COVID <laughs> or any type of infectious disease, the sense of isolation. Uh, then we get into some other aspects of the law in uh, Chapter 5. So if someone were to take someone unjustly from another person, they must make restitution for that. Very important to make restitution. But not only must they make restitution, there's an additional 20% penalty. So it's not just the restitution. It's the importance of the penalty. So the penalty, of course, for deterrence sake. Now, what if the person is dead and you can't make restitution to them. Ah, no problem. You give it to the priest. So as we can see, the priests make out pretty well in a lot of these uh, laws, that, that it really, it, a lot goes to them. Uh, and that was partly because the priests really didn't have any land that they owned uh, on their own. Uh, they didn't have any farming that they could do. or They were really pretty much uh, kind of for the people and for offering sacrifices. So that was really a major source of income for them was, were the offerings that were given to them. And so that's why they would be the ones who would get the uh, money that was due plus the 20% penalty, of course, uh, you know, to, to help them survive. Now, what happens if a man suspects that his wife has committed adultery, but there are no witnesses. Remember, uh, according to the law, there must be witnesses in order to prove it. But the man is suspicious. Maybe my wife has committed adultery. And here we get into one of those other types of laws that's more orientated in favor of the male than the female, because we don't hear any mention here of, well, what if the woman suspects the man? You see, so it's, there's no even-handedness here. Now, he can bring her to the priest, along with an offering of a tenth of an ephah of barley meal. So he goes to the priest, but he has to have his offering, so he's kind of paying the priest, because remember, the priest needs this to survive. Uh, and he, he brings her to the priest. <coughs> now, the priest, and this is kind of a strange little uh, ritual, the priest will have the woman drink a mixture of holy water from the dwelling tent, and some dust from the floor of the dwelling. So the water that is taken from the dwelling, probably the, the water that was used as part of the purification ritual, so it was considered holy water because it was in the dwelling. And then also the dust from the floor of the dwelling, and again, that would be considered sacred or holy. So this water and this dust is mixed together. Now, if the woman is guilty of adultery, the thought was her belly will swell and her thighs will waste away. Uh, and she won't be able then to have children. And if she couldn't have children, this would be a really a curse against her. So this was the way it was determined about the adultery. And the priest will first do a wave offering with the cereal, and then take a handful of the cereal offering and burn it on the altar. Then he will give the drink to the woman. So first he does the offering, and then the drink to the woman. 
Again, kind of a strange ritual. And again, we note the man is not involved, it's the woman. So we would look at this and say, well, this isn't too fair. You know, and the man just has suspicions. He has no proof. There are no witnesses to the, uh, to the adultery. Uh, chapter 6 talks about a very important vow, the Nazarite vow. The Nazir is the Hebrew word meaning to be set apart as sacred, as dedicated or vowed. So someone who took this vow, very serious, uh, they were dedicated to God, it was a solemn promise, uh, very important. Now when they take this vow, what do they do? Uh, they are dedicated to God, but they abstain from wine, and they also abstain from strong drink. And they can't eat any produce of the vine, and no razor shall touch their hair. And they shall, you shall not enter where a dead person is, even a mother or father or close family member. So that's how strict it was. Even someone who is close in the family, I mean, your mom, your dad, you can't enter in where the dead person is because, again, this would destroy the cleanliness of the person. It would be considered to be unclean because they had contact with a corpse. Now, what happens if someone dies suddenly in his presence and, and it, you know, he's not aware of it, the person just drops dead and dies? I mean, it's not his fault, right? What does he do? He shaves his head on the seventh day. On the eighth day, he brings two turtle doves or two pigeons to the priest. The priest will offer one as a sin offering and one as a holocaust to make atonement for his sin. Of course, we look at it objectively and say, hey, there really is no sin. They drop dead in your bed. That's how serious the vow was, that even if you didn't know it was going to happen, this was considered to be that serious. He then reconsecrates his head on the same day, and he brings a yearly lamb as a guilt offering. So there was a whole process of uh, becoming purified when you had been in contact with the corpse. When his time of dedication is over, he brings sacrifices to the priest, and he shaves his hair, placing it in the fire of the peace offering. After the ritual of the sacrifice is over, then he can drink wine. So he does that sacrifice, he's been purified, it's okay, he can drink wine, and he can resume with his vow. The Lord then shares a priestly blessing with Moses so that he can share it with Aaron and his sons, a very famous priestly blessing, blessing that is used to this day. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you kindly and give you peace. Uh, this blessing is very similar to Psalm 66, verse 2. And we see this used even to this very day. It's a very famous blessing, a very beautiful blessing, really. The Lord let his face shine upon you really means may the Lord really give you his life, uh, his, his light, uh, his power, his energy. Let his face shine upon you. Uh, beautiful blessing. Then in chapter 7, we see the princes bring these different offerings. They offered six wagons and twelve oxen. The Levites were to make use of them for transporting the material for the meeting tent. So the wagons were going to be used very importantly uh, to transport uh, some of the poles, some of the heavier uh, equipment that would be used to set up the meeting tent, because as the people are moving uh, in this process of going from Egypt to Canaan, uh, they take the tent with them and replace, they go, they're, they're setting up the tent, which is a, a kind of an elaborate process, and so they needed many people to help with the tent. The princes also presented offerings for the dedication of the altar, uh, one prince for each day. So it was divided up, and each day a different prince would come from the 12 princes. It was one prince or one leader from each tribe, and, and this was the one who kind of organized the tribe. Uh, we saw it in the book of Leviticus. They had special relationship in terms of the tribes. After the offerings were made, Moses went into the meeting tent, and he heard God's voice speaking to him. Uh, really a beautiful line that kind of sums up that special relationship that Moses had with God. He actually heard 
the voice of God speaking to him. Shows a couple of things here. Shows the importance of the meeting tent, the importance of Moses, and the importance of that relationship with God. So we see here the people really on their pilgrimage, continuing to be in relationship to God, to express this love for God, this concern for God, uh, and to really see that God is leading them in this special pilgrimage from Egypt to the Promised Land. And of course, who is the first one who made that pilgrimage from his hometown to Canaan, following the voice of God? It was, of course, our own beloved Father Abraham. And as we know, Father Abraham had many friends. Many friends had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so were you. So let's all praise the Lord. Keep on praising the Lord. God bless you, and keep on following God's covenant.